Okay, you ready? Whenever y'all are ready. Okay. okay. Only thing to keep in mind, um, if you do start looking through the notes, uh, don't be talking when you do it. Because he, he, he was bad about it in the beginning. He, he started, and you Okay, because you can then cut that out, right? Yeah. Not if you're talking. Yeah. Okay. If you're talking, so, you start doing so it. So if like, I just stop and then. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and he can cut it out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Actually, okay. let me get that side of your hair. So I'll just brush it behind you because you got, yeah, it was kind of sticking out. So now there we go. Thank you. you just have to fix You're it. Good. No, now you just took that, no, the other side. You just pulled it out. There you go. It's just one stray hair. All right. Thank you, Verna Jean, for agreeing to sit on the other side of the camera for us today and share some of your memories of Pflugerville. Please state your name, where you were born, and how long you've lived in Pflugerville. I'm Verna Jean Ruth Hebby Mott, and I was born in 1942 in Pflugerville on a farm three miles east of Pflugerville. Uh, Dr. Greg, who was the physician in Round Rock, came out to the house for the event. So I've lived here um, 72 years, although seven years was spent in Galveston, so uh, that would have been a little over 60 years actually in the community. Tell us your connection to the Pflugerville founding family. My great-grandfather was Conrad Pfluger, and he immigrated from Germany uh, when he was uh, about 18 years of age with his younger brother, George, who was 14, and they landed at Indianola. Uh, which was uh, south of Galveston, and then by ox and wagon they came along the Colorado River uh, basin to the Austin colony. Uh, they lived in uh, the village of Austin for just a, a year or two and then bought uh, acreage east of present-day Pflugerville where the Farks of the Wilbarger um, intersect. Um, Conrad then uh, 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 moved to uh, across from Emanuel Church where uh, the Gatlinburg community is and uh, he and his wife uh, Anna Elizabeth Wutrich who was from Switzerland uh, built their home there. My grandmother uh, Sophie was born there and uh, she told the story of when the uh, Indians came and uh, they had a, a rock cabin with not any windows, just a small little hole to look through. And uh, the Indians didn't harm them, but they uh, took corn and the milk cows. So that was the big thing. And then uh, my grandparents, um, Fluger, uh, Sophie married GC or Gutlip Carl Fluger, and their homestead. Uh, is about five miles east of Pflugerville and the home is still standing. I had 21 cousins that I grew up with and my mother had, uh, there were nine sisters and a, a brother. And then my dad was a heavy uh, and they actually um, uh, immigrated in the late 1890s uh, to the Highland community which is near Three Point. But they relocated their farm east of Pflugerville so my mother and dad actually grew up about a mile and a half apart. They dated for 10 years. They couldn't get married because of the Depression. There was no money. Uh, and then my dad was a, a farmer, so uh, they relied upon the uh, rich, fertile soil in the Blackland Prairie uh, to make a living. And so we had uh, cattle and cotton and corn and cucumbers. and uh, that's where my uh, work ethic came from because uh, I had two siblings, younger brothers, and we all had chores 24-7. Um, during the drought in 1957, the late 50s, which was uh, a very severe drought, uh, somewhat comparable to what we're enduring right now in 2011 through 14, um, the farmers had a, a very hard time uh, and so alternative uh, 
means of income were looked for. So my uh, father uh, decided to take up photography and he started taking pictures at the school for the annual group pictures. He took pictures for uh, weddings, um, for 50th anniversaries, whatever the occasion was, uh, he was the photographer. And then my mother would take the film down to Studman's on, at that time it was 19th Street, and get it developed and then they would do that. The other thing is they um, uh, went into the chicken business and had 1,000 laying hens. And so that was uh, the chore we did before and after school of uh, gathering the eggs. We would have to uh, put them in an egg washer. Then we would have to run them over a candler, which the light would shine through, and, and they would be graded whether they were small, medium, large, or extra large eggs. They were boxed. And then... Um, uh, we would take them to Austin to sell. Uh, St. David's Hospital was one of the clients and then uh, uh, the, some of the grocery stores in Austin. My mother and father were very involved in a lot of uh, activities. Uh, there was the Richland Community Club. Uh, my dad eventually served on the uh, school board. My grandfather had also served on the school board. Um, and uh, they were active in church on Sunday. Everybody went to church and then to uh, my grandmother's house for um, Sunday dinner and playing with the cousins. Tell us about a normal day for you as a child. What did you do when you got up in the morning? Well, um, if you had cows, they had to be milked twice a day. So you would get up in the morning before school and uh, uh, you'd have to go milk. We didn't have but about three to five cows, I guess, that, that had to be milked. And then you would, um, you had to eat a breakfast. And then we caught the bus uh, to go to school. And uh, there really weren't, but uh, there was maybe two buses for the whole district. But uh, as a first grader, uh, I was on the same bus with the 12th grader, Miss Winnie Mae Markison, uh, who lived about two miles from me. And uh, that was my first uh, memory of, of knowing her. Um, when we got home from school, we would change out of our school clothes because uh, you, you might have to wear it again another day. Uh, and you put on your work clothes and then you went out to do the, uh, the evening chores. And um, uh, during the uh, uh, planting and harvest season, there were usually, you would have to go out in the field maybe and uh, actually do some work. Um, I can remember missing uh, school uh, in order to help my dad in uh, planting of the crops and uh, we had a mule named Dan. It was actually my grandfather's uh, uh, big mule uh, and he was the workhorse. Uh, and I was so embarrassed because, uh, you know, you can turn a car around or a tractor around, but to turn a horse around with the roller behind it, they were just wide wheels. The wheels got hung up in the fence, and I didn't know how to put that mule in reverse and get the, the, the um, wheels out of the fence. So I was in a pickle because I didn't know where my dad was, and we finally, uh, the horse and I had a conversation, and we finally made it in one way. So you were by yourself. I field. was by myself, and of how course. How old were you then? Uh, so maybe nine or so. Out in the field by yourself. Yes, yes. And then um, uh, when the cotton was ready to be picked, um, we had families from the um, South Texas, Carrizo Springs, that would come and live in our hand house. And that was such a, a fun time for me because we had some, we had other children to play with. And um, we would be in the fields working together, and then, uh, you know, if we ate a snack or something, we would we would have that time together. But we would run and play. When we uh, would come home from school, though, instead of riding the school route on the bus all the way around, we wouldn't have gotten home till five o'clock. So, we would get off of the bus at what's presently Wise Lane and walk about a mile and a half home, so that we could get home earlier and start our chores. Uh, and, um, Tell that, us about going to school. You talk about where did you go to elementary school? And, uh, 
In first grade, there was a, uh, a World War II barracks uh, that my first grade teacher was in, Miss Doty. There was a coal stove. Uh, we had to put coal in it and get it going in the cloakroom. Uh, there were carnivals in the uh, rock gym. Uh, then we went, uh, third and fourth grade were in the red brick school that was built in 1921. It, they were upstairs. Uh, parents always had fundraisers in order to generate uh, money for special things, and uh, they would have uh, funny, humorous plays on the stage, and the whole community would turn out for that. Um, girls did not have athletics in middle school like they do now, but uh, there were uh, organized athletics in high school. Um, that was, basketball was the big thing, and the girls' basketball uh, tradition at Pflugerville has always been um, winning teams and going to, winning district, going to regionals and, and beyond that. I played in the Rock Gym when um, girls' basketball uh, actually was half court, so we had three forwards on one end and three guards on the other end, and you didn't cross the center court line. Um, and. Um, you know, I, I was playing as a ninth grader on the on the varsity team. You didn't have a JV team. We just had one team for the whole high school, which was probably a total of, of 75 or, or 80 students. Uh, football was a big thing for the boys. Uh, I was a cheerleader, and I remain uh, a cheerleader not in uniform, but uh, for our school children and for our community to um, keep the spirit going. Uh, a national beta club was organized uh, while I was in school, and that kind of uh, promoted service. Uh, I was in the National Honor Society, which um, did uh, service, scholarship, uh, character, and uh, um, academics. And uh, I think that's those early years of seeing my parents do service, and then in school where we looked at helping others uh, was very, uh, it was formative for me uh, a, as a servant leader for the rest of my life. So whatever, wherever I was living, I always tried to engage something uh, in the community. When we lived in Galveston for seven years, um, I wanted my children to go to a Sunday school. Well, it was an old church, very drab looking, so we decided we need to paint these rooms, the Sunday school rooms. So we go out and buy paint, and we just start painting with the kids and the adults, and, and we make it happen. Um, I was in the residents and in the um, medical wives uh, auxiliary group, uh, and we did service projects, you know, uh, on the island at the time. Uh, as my kids grew up, uh, I was a, a Girl Scout leader and a Boy Scout den leader, and and then uh, a coach for the girls' softball uh, team. And um, I guess one of the things you, you learn from even working with the little scouts, uh, their motto is be prepared. And uh, that's kind of another little um, slogan that just kind of always uh, is out there, you know. It, whatever we're doing, we need to be prepared. And uh, there were, uh, had the, the, the pleasure and honor of working with, uh, in my recent years, uh, three Eagle Scouts on their projects, and that was amazing to, to see these young men uh, organize and complete their, their projects. Uh, when you went to, to, when you graduated from high school, which I presume was Lugerville High School, where did, what did you do after that? Well, there were 13 in my graduating class, and uh, I was fortunate enough to, uh, be valedictorian, and uh, there is uh, a law, a practice in the state of Texas that if you are valedictorian, you have a tuition-free uh, ride to any state school. Uh, again, I, I graduated in 1960, so uh, that was uh, at the end of the drought. Uh, my family didn't have money, and so that tuition scholarship was a tremendous blessing in order to go to UT. I was a commuter student, which meant that I stayed at home, ate my meals at home, but I drove back and forth to, um, to UT. Uh, and I graduated uh, with honors after four years with a bachelor's in math and chemistry. Um, 
going into Austin to commute, uh, I-35 uh, had just been completed. It used to be East Avenue down close to the uh, uh, university, but the um, um, interstate had been completed, so that made the, the trip really quick. Uh, uh, it was still 70 miles an hour. We didn't even have seat belts back then, but, uh, and there wasn't very much traffic. Uh, but that was a lot quicker than uh, prior to the uh, um, I-35 or expressway being built. We would go down North Lamar, which is really the longest street in Austin because it goes all the way. For, uh, US 81 came in from the uh, Dallas um, Round Rock area, and then you would go through Coxville, and then you would go through Fiskville, and then you would get down to um, the Guadalupe area, the drag, and... Um, that was that. One of the things that happened in 1967, I think, and that was right after I'd left UT, but my brother was there, uh, Charles Whitman uh, went on his rampage in the tower, which was uh, uh, one of those memories that was etched forever uh, when that happened. But at UT, uh, it, was, it was kind of a, I had to study hard because coming from Fliggerville, I, uh, we didn't have all of the, um, advanced classes like the city schools of Austin, uh, San Antonio, Houston, and Dallas that they had. So the competition was very stiff uh, at that time. Um, JFK was the president in 1960. Uh, I was at uh, UT in 1963 uh, when he was assassinated and I was doing my student teaching at Austin High School and it was a very somber experience because uh, LBJ's youngest daughter, um, Lucy, uh, her friends were in my class. And so it was, uh, it, was, it was a very quiet, quiet day. But JFK had said, um, Sputnik had, uh, the Russians had, had uh, sent Sputnik up and um, it alerted the Americans that we were uh, kind of behind in this space game. And so JFK came on the black and white Admiral TV's screens of about 17 or 18 inches saying, you know, uh, citizens of the United States, we need physical fitness, we need math, and we need science. And that was uh, an inspiration to me that, uh, number one, I needed a job when I got out of college because I knew I did not want to work in the cotton fields back home uh, and um, so that has how I determined my major of math and uh, chemistry. Uh, it was interesting at UT, um, there was no such uh, uh, major as computer science. They taught several programming classes in COBOL and FORTRAN, and you had to go in and punch your cards uh, and put them in a box and be careful not to fall because uh, everything had to be in order to feed them into the huge computers. Uh, and it's amazing that today that same amount of memory is held in your hand and uh, it's just incredible. And for fun uh, at UT we would go to the, um, to the Union and uh, I remember uh, one time um, we had a student pass, so Johnny Cash came, the man in black. But he didn't quite make it to the stage for his performance because uh, he had indulged in too much uh, alcohol. And uh, so we were a disappointed crowd. Uh, it was the time, uh, again, in the 60s of Elvis Presley. And um, I didn't get to see Elvis at that moment, uh, but after we married and uh, Elvis was doing his tour, he was at the Houston Stock Show and I got a front row seat so I could see the king uh, at that time. And uh, of course, we, we liked his music. Uh, one of the things that we did do in high school also, we had May Fates. That was a, a tradition in the community, uh, particularly out at Richland uh, on um, a, a queen would be selected by the community, uh, and then on leap year, a king was selected. So uh, I was uh, actually a flower girl to the, uh, a queen in 1947, and then uh, in 
57, uh, I was uh, the queen of the my fight. And that was uh, an exciting time because you got to choose your court, your princess, and uh, all of the duchess, and then the duchesses would select their dukes, and uh, uh, the Kohlenbergs from New Braunfels would come up and play the polka music and the waltzes for the dance afterwards, and you danced, you fixed up the hall, so it was, it was a really exciting time. When you came to town frequently for items other than, for business other than school when you were a child, to Pflugerville. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, the, uh, the mercantile was probably the main place as a young girl, uh, and I say under about eight years of age is where we would come, and Mr. Stricker was there. John Pflugger was actually one of his, uh, uh, was in high school and was hired there to help, so I remember John working in uh, the mercantile. There were wood floors, and uh, uh, my grandparents uh, lived next door to us, uh, but we would take the cream from the, the cow's milk and we would churn our butter and then have to block it. And uh, you would bring the butter and the eggs to uh, the mercantile and exchange it for whatever else that you really needed, uh, sometimes maybe the chicken feed or whatever. We didn't exchange it for bread because everything at home was homemade bread. Uh, and you uh, didn't exchange it for meat because on the farm you, you had your chickens and your turkey that you butchered, you had your pigs that you uh, butchered and made sausage and ribs, etc. and then you had your beef uh, for the roast and uh, those things. Uh, so um, the, the feed that the, uh, came in sacks, so the sacks were even uh, floral prints so the cloth from the chicken feed sacks was then, uh, once, once you'd used all the feed to feed the chickens, um, you'd wash the, the, the cloth and uh, something would be sewed, whether it was a blouse or a skirt uh, or an apron or something of that nature. What were some of the other businesses that you frequented? Uh, well, uh, on Saturday I can remember coming with my grandfather, Hebby, uh, and it was... Uh, it, it was such a treat to go to Mr. Nasey's to get ice cream because uh, uh, he had superior dairies by the cone that you could get and a little bitty table that you could sit at or you could go out on the sidewalk and he had a bench that you could sit and lick that uh, ice cream cone and that was very good. There were other businesses but they were not, uh, the, the Donhofer uh, grocery store was there but uh, again we mostly came to the mercantile. The Steger, uh, a dry goods store was there, and I can remember going into it. It had shoes, but it was in competition with the Mercantile. So you, uh, for some reason, we went on Main Street to the Mercantile, and Mr. Nacy's store was next door to that. So uh, we didn't do as much business with the Steger store or the Donhofer store. The Donhofer store, though, uh, burned um, probably in the 50s, but it had been the original store in the original settlement of the, the village of Fliggerville, which is at present day Emanuel and Pecan intersection. And it was moved west when the um, MKT Railroad came through. Uh, uh, and, and so the Donhofer store was, was fairly near the railroad. Do you remember the railroad coming through? Uh, I remember the railroad, yes. Uh, 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 mainly there was, uh, on Pecan Street, there was a little humpty dump uh, with your car. If you were driving, you have to it, you had to go over the tracks, and that would kind of rattle things in the car. Um, I never rode the train. We didn't go any place uh, because we were always working on the farm. The, uh, we would take car trips to my aunt down in El Campo, and we would go to Austin, and that was that was pretty much. Uh, when I was uh, a teenager, my parents allowed me to, uh, they, they would pay me a small fee for uh, our wages for having chopped cotton and that, and I was able to go to uh, a National Luther League convention. Uh, it was, one was in Milwaukee, one was at Cornell University in Upper State New York. And those were um, very uh, inspiring uh, trips because uh, we were with, uh, young people, teenagers from all over the United States. And uh, 
I, I think those were, uh, again, some critical uh, times in my life because uh, uh, my confirmation verse was, uh, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And uh, a second verse that uh, was at one of the conventions was from Philippians 4.13. It said, um, I can do all things in him who strengthens me. And uh, I think today, I, I always hear people say to me, how can you do what you do? And I say, it's not me doing it. Um, uh, I'm thankful for my health, but I know that when we're working for the goodness of all people that things can happen. What brought you back to Pflugerville after you said you had left for seven years? I presume you left. Well, we, we lived in Galveston for seven years. I met, uh, well, I, I married uh, the love of my life and best friend, and he was an all-central Texas running back, and I was the cheerleader, and uh, we, we commuted together to UT. And uh, my parents said, you cannot get married until you have a college degree, period. And you did what your parents said back then. Uh, so we went off to Galveston uh, with uh, less than 29 cents in the bank. Uh, but uh, I, I uh, secured a job, and he went through medical school. Uh, and we returned to Austin in uh, 1968, where he did his internship at Brackenridge. And at that time, I came uh, out to teach at Pflugerville. Uh, it was uh, at, uh, at the present site of Timmerman Elementary. Uh, and I taught five or six different classes, uh, different courses. I found out uh, about um, in November, December that I was pregnant. In those days, you could not be a teacher in a classroom if you were pregnant. So I had to uh, resign. And uh, so that was the end of that teaching career uh, at that time. Uh, also in teaching, you had to wear a dress. You could not wear jeans. You could not wear slacks. You could not look slouchy. So uh, the wardrobe was, was very different then. Uh, after my husband went back to Galveston for three more years for his residency in radiology, we returned to Austin. and. Uh, that was actually in um, 1975. And uh, one of the things that had happened back in uh, 1966, uh, 1965, 66, when Lyndon Johnson became president was the civil rights uh, movement was going on. And there was the, uh, the uh, no longer segregated schools, but the schools were integrated. So the uh, uh, Austin Independent School District, where I taught at Austin High for uh, a year down on Town Lake, um, they had to uh, uh, they had a court challenge to uh, implement uh, fair schooling, and and they were busing young children around uh, all over Austin in order to meet the demands of the federal government, and uh, so. There was a lot of uncertainty as to where our children would be going to school, what time the schools would be, how I would pick them up with my husband being a, being a physician. And we just needed more stability in our life. So we uh, considered our options and we decided to come back to Pflugerville, uh, mainly because both, of our, both sets of our parents and our relatives lived here and we wanted to be out in the country. Let's talk a little bit about Deutschenfest. Didn't your mother help uh, organize the first Deutschenfest? In 1976, Ronald Reagan was president of the United States. And uh, to celebrate the bicentennial of the United States from 1776, uh, he uh, encouraged communities all across America to celebrate that event in some manner. And so the uh, a small group in Pflugerville, a committee got together, and it was, uh, she was on the committee with uh, Gladys Pfluger and Otto Pfluger and others, uh, and they came up with the idea of the, of the Deutschenfest, and the, uh, the first one was at the, uh, the actual uh, stadium by Pflugerville High School. It was called the New Stadium at that time, and they had a grand event there. I was, I don't remember that exact event, and, uh, uh, they started with their floats and the parades, but uh, 
I do remember in, uh, when I came back to teach then, when we moved back to Pflugerville, I, I started teaching here in Pflugerville, and uh, I was teaching German and physics and the gifted and talented and uh, geometry and algebra and, and all the math classes. So for my German club, we decided we would do a booth at Deutschenfest uh, as a fundraiser. And um, we came up with the idea to do a Wurstorito. Uh, and Wurst means sausage. And um, this was before people were onto sausage wraps. So we got the flour tortilla and we got a hot sausage from um, Taylor or Elgin and my husband barbecued those. And then we got uh, a layer of, of cheese and we sold those and then we got the the wooden uh, 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 things of, of a, a male and female uh, German little person we could stick your head through and take your picture so they could snap pictures and that was our, uh, that was our fundraiser. And, the, and the, the high school kids just worked delightfully on that. How has it changed since those early years? Um, it's changed a lot. I think the, the, the parade has gotten longer uh, because uh, we have bands from the schools uh, that are involved. You have uh, surrounding communities uh, who uh, bring their floats. Um, there's the dignitaries show up. Uh, and uh, a lot of the little uh, cheer teams, um, they'll get on the back of a trailer. And so the parade has changed. It starts at 11 o'clock and uh, it starts now way out at Park Crest Middle School and comes down Railroad and then turns down Main Street. Um, the Heritage House Museum, uh, we, we uh, now have, uh, our part in the parade is we, we get an antique car, usually a Model T, our very early 1920s uh, vehicle, and uh, that, that's kind of a fun thing. And of course then uh, going to the park, uh, it's, it's uh, it's a physical thing, you have to walk, uh, but it's lovely under the uh, grove of uh, trees with, you know, sh shade and uh, vendors that have all kinds of wares that, uh, that you can see. But it started off as local groups with being the vendors, right? And yes, grown right. And uh, it was mostly the, the churches uh, and the civic clubs, the Lions and the uh, uh, St. Elizabeth's, Emmanuel, uh, and the Little League. Whoever needed to raise money, it was their fundraiser. And uh, it has expanded uh, definitely beyond that. Now, one of your passions is education of our children. After retiring from teaching, what prompted you to run for election to the PISD board? Well, I taught for 35 years at the secondary level, again, math and chemistry. And uh, when I retired, uh, I've always loved kids, particularly any, any age, but my passion was with the teenagers. Uh, I firmly believe that uh, for a democracy to survive, we have to have an educated citizenry. And uh, schools are changing. And uh, I didn't retire thinking I was going on the school board. It just happened at the time I did retire from teaching that uh, a gentleman, Mr. Clifford Danstrom, who had served for many years, decided to retire. And so I had talked to at least eight or nine potential candidates that they should run for that position. And they were all too busy in their career or too involved with their children's activities. And um, finally, Mr. Leonard Daring pointed his finger at me and said, you should do it. And uh, he gave me a $50 check. And uh, with that, uh, thank goodness we had email already then, so uh, I didn't have to expend a lot of campaign funds. Um, I did a lot of it by email and by phone but I did uh, use that to get a few signs and put around and, and I was elected. And I, uh, for the last uh, uh, 11 years, uh, when my time has come up, I, I have not had a challenger for my position. But I think more importantly, um, the reason is you wanna give back to your community. Your community is only as strong as your schools, your organizations, uh, that makes the community. 
And um, I think my core values, uh, uh, I want to think that they will, can be passed on to uh, another generation. And as people come into our community, that we can help them learn about Pflugerville, what, what we, our expectations are here in Pflugerville. Uh, after I got onto the board and I realized the learning curve, um, I, I saw that a, a, uh, the state of Texas legislature has a lot of power on the funding of, of public schools. And so I, uh, I educated myself and I got involved in testifying on certain bills and uh, decided to run for the Texas Association of School Boards uh, as a director. And so I've had the uh, honor, privilege, and responsibility of serving on that group uh, now for uh, nearly uh, eight years. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's really been an amazing experience to talk with uh, trustees from around the state of Texas, large districts, small districts, urban, rural, wealthy, not wealthy, uh, about school issues and uh, it, it's amazing how in, in some areas of Texas uh, the population has been decreasing so that school districts have had to consolidate. Uh, that actually happened here in Pflugerville uh, back in the 70s, on uh, the period of time that I was not living here. Uh, uh, the resources to fund the schools was so limited that there were serious talks, and it was nearly up to the point of an election. They nearly scheduled a, an election to see if uh, Pflugerville, Hoto, and Maynor wanted to consolidate. And um, it didn't happen. And I think when you fast forward to present day and we look at those uh, the fast growth districts, that it's just um, a good thing that it didn't happen. Well, how do you think the responsibilities and the priorities have changed, the new challenges that have happened over the last 11 years that you've been on the board? Well, I think that, uh, for one thing, Pflugerville is a fast growth district. It is a very diverse district. It's changed from an, uh, a small, rural, uh, Caucasian community into uh, a school district that uh, more than 40 languages are spoken. Uh, we've changed now to a, a minority majority district. Uh, we're uh, over 23,000 students. Uh, we have, uh, because some of our programs are exemplary, we have uh, parents who move to the Pflugerville area uh, so that their uh, children that may have special needs, whatever they might be, can be served uh, in a good way. Um, the state has changed graduation uh, requirements numerous times and put uh, accountability um, standards in uh, into course exams. Uh, so uh, it's a challenge to stay on top of what the law is and, and trying to move uh, the whole, uh, all of the children forward. And one of the issues um, that's, that's a challenge today is um, finding enough teachers who are qualified as bilingual teachers to come into our schools and uh, be ready to uh, get into the classroom with the students and move, move things forward. Uh, and funding is always going to be an issue and uh, thankfully um, uh, the bond issues that the voters, the, the citizens and the community thus far have, have supported a bond program so that we can continue to build community schools and not um, have too many um, portable buildings. Uh, our extracurricular activities that our students are involved in, our students are great ambassadors, whether they're football players, basketball players, volleyball, if they're in the Science Olympiad, uh, if they're in uh, UIL debate or one act play, uh, they're traveling around uh, the state in competitions, doing well and carrying the Pflugerville flag. Well, you've consistently demonstrated your love for your ancestral home of Pflugerville. Tell us why it's important to you to preserve this history, the rich history of this community, and some of the ways that you're ensuring that it is preserved for future generations. Uh, I, I believe that uh, 
even though I was a math science major, uh, my passion is history. And uh, I think we have to understand our past in order to do what's best in our present and to prepare for the future. Uh, I had the opportunity uh, with my husband when he went to a medical meeting to go to Williamsburg, Virginia, and to see uh, the, the, the little town, the buildings that were there in early America. Uh, when I came back to Pflugerville, I thought, oh my, we should preserve our history. And uh, so again, when I retired from teaching, I'll fast forward, uh, uh, my mother had taken pictures, she had documented some things, and I thought, I need to leave this for the next generation because my own children didn't know all of the story. And uh, thankfully, I found some cohorts, some very good friends that um, had a similar passion, and we went to a couple of workshops, and we have been able to uh, take the resources that we found. We've actually had to dig for some of them and, uh, and to preserve them, and uh, they'll be here for the next 50 years. Um, the Heritage House Museum was another uh, area that I, I felt um, we needed a place that people could identify with where uh, newcomers to our town uh, could find out something about the heritage. It's a very rich heritage. And so there was a group, uh, again, of ladies, and uh, also it was the home that Clarence Bowles had lived in that um, was donated to the city, and it, it became the uh, landmark for the museum. And uh, we've been able to collect uh, family histories, uh, photos, and artifacts. The Flicker House out on Flickerville Parkway now will be 140 years old, and uh, uh, while it's in disrepair presently, uh, there has been a movement and a collection of citizens who are working to uh, restore that and to uh, make it, uh, incorporate it with the uh, development of our new city in that area. I've also been able to go around to the schools and to tell uh, Grade school children uh, are children of any level. Talk to them about the, the heritage uh, or the history of Pflugerville. Digital archives? Uh, the digital archives, that is the most recent project that is probably the most exciting because as technology has changed, uh, the ability to uh, preserve and to share the history uh, is a lot easier now. And uh, so uh, the city of Pflugerville has the equipment and the personnel who are very highly trained. And uh, so I think this is going to be a, uh, a tremendous resource uh, for researchers or for people who simply want to learn about the community and uh, an, an easy way to, to uh, capture the, the stories of the past. What are you proudest about Pflugerville? What, what, what are you proudest about Um I think uh, I look at the PFs. Uh, Flugger uh, means plow uh, in German. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I'm going to go away from the question for just a minute and talk about being um, passionate about a few things. Uh, there was a lady called Madeline Murray O'Hare who, uh, on the national level, decided she wanted to take prayer out of the school. And uh, I, along with some of, uh, a few of my uh, students in non-school activities, okay, these were just neighborhood, but we were, there were a couple of teenagers. We go down to Austin and we carry our signs and we protest. We didn't like that. Uh, the city of Austin decided that uh, they needed a new airport. Three times they decided they needed a new airport. And their first choice was always to come to the Blackland Prairie, the farmland. And uh, we made signs that said, you can't plow runways. Once the fertile Blackland Prairie is covered with concrete, there is no reverting back to growing crops to the breadbasket of Texas. Um, I live on Wilbarger Creek. 
that Wilbarger Creek was named after Josiah Wilbarger, who actually was part of uh, Stephen F. Austin's colony, and his, uh, his homestead was down on the Colorado River, but that's how the creek got its name. But he was scalped by the Indians. And the Wilbarger Basin is a lovely basin filled with all kinds of wildlife, particularly birds, all kinds of animals, hawks, owls. And uh, I, I think those things should be somehow preserved, and I see the snowball rolling that uh, they may become extinct. The family farm in Pflugerville is extinct. Economic development is the king, and we're going to do whatever we need to to continue to expand. Um, so if I go to the PFs, back to what, what am I proudest about with Pflugerville, I think the, the Pflugerville family feeling, PF family, PF feeling, and the PF fun, uh, and the PF farm, those all go together uh, as being uh, the community of people who care about one another and will do for each other in whatever, whatever it takes to happen. And uh, when you, when anything gets bigger and bigger, uh, it is, um, it's so easy to lose the connection with people, the collaboration, looking at problems, trying to find out what's best. Uh, and I think one of the things that, that Pflugerville has forever been is whatever comes up as a, uh, a need, something that needs to be done, we would like to have this, that it's been a community effort that's come together to make it happen. And uh, so there's numerous things in that category that I, I can say the Fallen Warrior Memorial, the Pflugger Hall, uh, the Deutschenfest, uh, the schools, all of that has happened because the community is passionate and dedicated to those core values of, of togetherness. Having said that, what is your hope for the next 10, 15, 50 years for Florida? Well, number one is I hope it remains a uh, safe and inviting place, a destination where families will want to come, will want to live. It's proximity to Austin, to the Hill Country, uh, to any part of Texas. It's, it's a delightful, it's a delightful place. Uh, there is shopping now. Uh, uh, I like the, wh where I live out in the country, it's very quiet yet, so I can, I can be in town and have everything I need, but I can still go to my little quiet area. Uh, so I, I, I hope that, that we'll retain uh, excellent schools. Uh, I, I believe that that's critical to any community uh, because it, it drives the people who come and who want to stay and who want to be involved and uh, I think uh, citizens need to be involved. Uh, uh, I hope that people will become involved in the community whether it's through uh, you know the citizens on patrol, the Fakona, their churches, their schools, there's so much to be done to, uh, uh, to be involved whether it's with elderly, children, uh, parks, uh, they can stay physically fit. We have lots of health um, areas also that are that have come online. We have a small airport, so there's a lot of opportunities in Pflugerville that uh, I, I think um, it makes it a, a, a place that has it all. One thing we didn't talk about was your volunteerism because you've certainly followed your parents' example. Are there any specific areas that you want to uh, Tell us about with your volunteerism and the well, importance uh, of volunteerism. I, I think that uh, uh, I have seen people talk about things. They'll use the word, we need to do this or we should do this. And I think when you're a volunteer, it's good to have a plan. But I have seen in my lifetime so many good plans that have stayed on the shelf or on the table. And uh, I would say uh, I like to see things go into action. In other words, let's get something done. It may not be 100% perfect, but we're going to make an attempt to accomplish a particular goal. And uh, I, I think uh, 
again, life is short on planet Earth. So uh, you pick and choose what you want to do. And uh, volunteering is, uh, if you can make someone else's day better, uh, it's a good day. It's a very good day. And um, I, I know that uh, sometimes projects get completed. Uh, the Pflugerville Education Foundation was another um, cool thing that happened. But when you want something to happen, birthing it uh, takes a tremendous amount of energy, sometimes legal counsel, sometimes expertise, uh, and then to make it sustainable. Uh, and to get the right people in the leadership positions is uh, a, a, a big, big, big thing. And so I think uh, the key for citizens is to get involved, meet people, and come together for a common good and, and work in that direction. Is there anything else that we've forgotten about today that you'd like to add to? I do want to talk about uh, stock shows, okay? okay. Uh, uh, as a, uh, another high school activity, I was involved in a stock show uh, locally and then in, uh, at Austin. And um, I showed pigs and chickens. And you had to wash your chickens before you took them to the show. And it was a very, very, very cold day. And we did not bring animals in the house on the farm. Your dogs, your cats, the cows, everybody stayed outside. Well, these were my precious chickens that were going to the stock show. Well, I washed it, left it outside, but it was freezing. It was a frozen chicken outside. So I had to bring my chicken in a box inside and unthaw it. It was alive. It stayed alive. Then my pig, it was a red Duroc pig. Girls did not show pigs, but my parents, that's, that's what you're going to show. Well, the boys, uh, the 4-H and FFA boys, could stay in the stock show barn down in Austin at the Coliseum overnight with their animals, but girls were not allowed to do that. So I took my pig down there, washed it, put it in its pen, came home, went down the next day to show my pig, got down there, and my poor little pig's tail was missing because the the boy who had uh, the pigs in the pen next to mine had bit my pig's tail off, and it was just so embarrassing. Okay, then I, I will fast forward to um, when my children were in school, and we were in 4-H and FFA. They raised uh, cattle, steers, and sheep. So you had to uh, groom your steers. You had to have what we would call hairspray, Okay, so my job was to fix the tail. So they would go in and wash the steer, and then we would have the hair blowers, you know, and we would blow in. So then you remember how we ratted our hair? We would rat the tail, and then you had to have, a, you had to get behind the rump of the calf so that you made the tail, that bun, just perfect so that it would make the judge look and accentuate, you know, the shape of the, of the animal. So, um, there were some uh, the cool stories from, from that. Uh, I remember uh, also as a Little League uh, softball coach for the girls, uh, our team won the, the district championship, so I got to coach the All-Stars. Well, we thought we were going all the way to state. We got to our first All-Star game, and we played it in Taylor. And I, I made the lineup, and... Um, the little girl that got up to pitch, she got so nervous that we, we lost that game, and it was just one of those memorable things. Uh, another exciting thing was what we called JC and Company. When I started teaching in Pflugerville, nearly all of the uh, high schoolers went to Emanuel Lutheran. So when new people came to town, they simply gravitated to the church where most of the kids were. So we started a, a, a contemporary band singing group with just guitars that didn't have any uh, keyboards at that time and they were called G JC and Company, Jesus Christ and Company. We started traveling around the area to different churches and we would go down town Austin uh, on during December and uh, Carroll on Congress Avenue and we had lot, lots of events and it, it was a, a very memorable uh, memorable time for me and also for those uh, students over probably about a 10 or 15 year period that was pretty exciting. So I think that's that's it. You have something else? No. Okay. Well, thank you for okay. your passion, your dedication. Your